Welcome well, everyone. Anyway. Uh, so this is a new exhibit. It's by uh, it's photography by Rachel Sussman of the oldest living things in the world. Thank you for coming. We also want to thank Lisa Carlin for being a longtime supporter of this program. Um, today we will hear from our associate curator of art, Rhonda Minton. Hi, everybody. Following <laughs> that will be uh, our local photographer, Erin Linsau. Um, there will be an opportunity at the end to uh, ask more questions, and um, we hope that you enjoy. And we are really, really excited to have this exhibit in the museum. Um, it's important to us here because it really addresses um, and examines our relationship with nature, which is one of the things that we're really interested in at the museum. We've, we're, we collect wildlife art, but part of our mission is also to um, investigate humanity's relationship with nature. And this exhibit really, really does that. Um, it has a strong, strong connection between science and art, as you can see. Um, look in these cases. Uh, and about all kinds of living organisms on, on our planet. Um, so Rachel Sussman is an artist living in Brooklyn. Um, she has had numerous exhibits and awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, many residencies, uh, including the McDowell Colony. Um, among her, her resume is really, really long. And I'm not going to read it to you, <laughs> but um, she's a really interesting artist, and she will actually be here later this summer on June 23rd, um, having a conversation with the artist that is in this next gallery. So the two of them will be here talking about their exhibits together um, and some of the ideas that either connect or don't connect. Um, so one of the things that is also really, really key, and she is really uh, interested in having us understand, is that this exhibit is some pretty formal photography, which you see on, in the King Gallery. But she is an amazing writer. This project is also about her travels to all of these areas. Um, and she's also a, a very good researcher. <laughs> so. She is, so this project is not just some photographs. It's all of these things combined that are coming into bringing us information about these organisms. So I'm going to read a couple of quotes. One is something that she uses to describe her approach. So she says of her work, I approach my subjects as individuals of whom I'm making portraits in order to facilitate an anthropomorphic connection to a deep time scale, otherwise too, too physiologically challenging for our brain to internalize. Together, my portraits and writing are meant to provide a window onto the living history of our planet and what we stand to lose in the future. So what she's doing is starting with uh, uh, with organisms that are 2,000 years old or older. And the reason why she chose that time is because that's year zero for us. So, <laughs> some of you probably have this in your hand, and you can see that there are numbers next to these and not a bunch of text on the wall. This is a key and a map to all of the objects, and it has great little stories about all of these things that she's gone all over the world to, to photograph. Um, in the foreword to her book, uh, Hans Ulrich Orbst commented that what sets Sussman apart from other conceptual artists is that her research project is closely related to the research of a scientist. Her work is defined by curiosity, humane character, a fascination with deep time, and the courage of an explorer. So today, what the education department has done is invite a local photographer and, uh, named Aaron Linsdow, and he's the second only American to ski alone across Antarctica to the South Pole. He's a polar explorer, a motivational speaker, and commercial photographer. Aaron is also the author of Antarctic Tears. So Aaron came earlier this week and uh, spoke with Rachel while she was here installing with us. And now he's going to speak to some of his conversations with her and observations about Rachel and her work. So thanks for being here, Aaron. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I know this is a little bit questionable weather here in Jackson, but all of you are brave people. This is a far worse conditions. As you see in some of the photographs here, that Rachel definitely didn't go to Paris, London, Rome, easy places, because the things that survived this long don't live in the convenient places. They actually live in the hard places of the world, because only through challenge and suffering, as Rachel discovered in her 10 years of exploration to create this exhibit, did she discover that only in the tough things can you thrive for a long time. So how did Rachel get started? In 2004, she was on a trip to Japan, having a good time, but a little bit challenging for her. She hadn't really gone to major trips in foreign lands. And she was just about to leave when she heard about this tree, 7,000 years old in Japan. And I was like, 7,000 years old? No way, that's impossible. So she goes on this trek, meets some people, two-day hike into the middle of the forest in Japan, and there she finds this tree. And there she discovers the inspiration of her project that consumed an entire decade of her life. So that's how she got started. We're going to actually, I guess we can start in this part of the exhibit. So if everyone just kind of filter on down here, and we'll kind of go in reverse, just to scoot on down, I can kind of project, so please just walk on in there. And what you're going to see is on the left wall here, some of the scientific articles she used to realize some of the research and discover some of the time that people have figured out things like a bacteria that repairs its own DNA and lives 500,000 years old. Is that even possible? Science says so. A plant that has clippings from Tasmania, 43,000 years old, it clonally grows. So if anybody's seen movies in the last few years about robots and things taking over the earth and lasting a long time, well, perhaps these are the actual characters. There's actually a photograph of the senator tree here that's well worth looking at. It's over 2,000 years old, and that tree used to be the reason that people went to Orlando, Florida, before they called BB or before Disney. <laughs> and unfortunately, the exact date of the death of that tree is known, because a couple of kids got into that area and said, hey, we're going to do some meth, we're going to light up and do all this, and hey, we can't quite see our drugs, so we're going to light a few matches to see what we're doing in a tree 2,000 years old. So they know the exact date that that tree died. And we discover that Facebook actually does have a purpose. <laughs> Sometime later, this young lady typed, hey, guess what I did? Soon the authorities caught up with her. So part of this exhibit is talking about that though these creatures, almost all of them plants, a few of them animals, have lasted a long time, it takes great care to make sure we don't wipe them out inadvertently, as we'll see with one of the plants from South Africa as well. Down the line there, Rachel's also posted a historic measure of way the heck back to the beginning of time all the way to modern times. It's well worth to look at, quite interesting. She even has a marker on there talking about the oldest known hut ever created by man, purportedly 500,000 years old in Japan. Quite interesting to see. And then time moves forward from there about any marks of man on the history of the world. So if everyone uh, wants to come over around here. Now as Bronwyn talked about, Rachel had quite a few adventures and she used part of this material as her research. She's not only a scientist, but an artist and a literature person. You can see documentation books from Richard Dawkins, Henry David, Ralph Waldo Emerson. She really actually has a broad perspective in the things she uses and what inspires her to go out in the world and do these things. A photograph up there, that elephant seal isn't quite 2,000 years old. But on her trip, she got to go to South Georgia Island. Whereas anyone familiar with the stories of Shackleton, yeah. Scott Amundsen, she actually had to go there to discover and find pictures of Antarctic moss over 2,000 years old. It's quite an expedition to get there. You can't just commercially fly there. There are only a couple ways to get there. And one of the trips she used was on the National Geographic Explorer cruise ship. Cruise ship not meaning the princess line going through the Caribbean. Cruise ship meaning ice hardened going through the southern ocean. Basically 
uh, hurling your stomach out perpetually to try and make it. It's not a pleasant thing to get there, but once you get there, it's history and incredible, incredible age of items. That little x-ray plate down there, this is the record of Rachel Sussman's only missed photograph in all of her travels that she went around the world. She had broken her wrist walking down a walkway, and she said, it's one of those things in the U.S. that would be totally sued about and would be illegal. Steep slope, shiny sort of tile, and it's wet, and what's going to happen? <sighs> so unfortunately, she broke her wrist on the trip to Sri Lanka. But other than that, she did pretty well. So traveling the whole world, going to all these potentially scary places and only breaking your wrist, not too bad. We'll talk another story a little bit way down the hall here about her experience in Greenland as well. If everyone wants to come over here and you look at this case, she actually has a couple pine cone samples from the Methuselah Walk in California. It's in the White Mountains. That's from a bristle cone pine, one of the oldest trees in existence here. Also pine cones from the sequoias. There's a couple photographs of sequoias as well. They used to be thought of as the oldest living plants, but as research has shown in the last 30 or 40 years, they're children compared to some of these things in the exhibits. One interesting thing to note is there's this little pile of soil here. I kind of want to big deal about that. On the wall there are representations of four kingdoms that we know. And in the bottom right, this little ugly blob. I think, oh, geez, why did she take a photograph of this ugly blob? It doesn't have beautiful sunsets, no. That actinobacteria, by research, has been shown to be 500,000 years old. It has the ability to repair and synthesize its own DNA in sub-freezing conditions in Siberia. So when you think about all these monster movies and all this, something that can actually be alive and sub-freezing temperatures, and not only that, it actually repairs its own DNA. So humans, animals, will have this problem with cancer where cells start to get damaged, the DNA goes haywire. That thing has the ability to live forever in conditions we can't even test. No scientist has been bold enough to say, hey, I'm going to culture this thing and have it hang out for 100 years in my lab. I mean, think 100 years ago. We're barely driving cars around the world. How are you going to even test this? Nobody's even figured that out yet. Please? On the wall there is one of the more colorful photographs of Elephant Island. That's where Shackleton's team originally got stuck. And they only had a short time to spin. Rachel Sussman actually got to go with Peter Hillary, son of the great Edmund Hillary, who's guided a lot of people around the world. They only had a few moments, because the seas were so bad, as you can see in that photograph, that they had to pretty much get on their zodiac, get to that island, take a couple shots, and then get out of there. Because when bad weather and everything moves in, you might end up trapped like Shackleton or worse. Please? And you'll see that there are actually several photographs. Oh, come on, come on. Don't want everybody to get lost in the back there. Medusa kelp, it's all clonally grown. Some of these trees are not. Why do we need to make a differentiation of, so how did these things live this long? Well, their demarcation about 6,000 years old is about the oldest thing that science and Rachel Sussman has discovered that can live individually. So an individual white bark pine, an individual sequoia grows from a germination and then grows and creates all of its cells versus something grown clonally, like a lot of the plants you'll see here, that can grow potentially forever, like those clippings in Tasmania, where it clones itself. And theoretically, you can do the Ponce de Leon thing, where you can find the fountain of youth. All you have to do is figure out how to clone yourself. And there are a lot of these plants in these exhibits when you see these ages of, oh my gosh, is that possible? Well, sure. I mean, does anybody take a plant clipping, put it in the soil, and have it grow? Well, think if you keep doing that, but that particular plant has the ability to perfectly clone its own DNA. Some of these plants do have that. Down here, this particular eucalyptus that Rachel had photographed and had the chance to explore, she actually had to promise that she wouldn't tell the species of this particular eucalyptus in Australia. 
Because if she did, people would figure out, oh, the scientific name of the eucalyptus would actually give away its location. And people have this desire to come and take a sample and take it home. We all do, I don't know why. And then you put it in your drawer, and then it's forgotten, maybe thrown in the trash. So certain things like this all around the world have to be protected. And that's part of Rachel's documentation of, we have to think about these things. Because it doesn't take too much, a few visitors, just like everybody's been in Grand Teton, like, oh gosh, why do they have these fences around the parks and everything? Think Yellowstone, three million visitors walking through this particular space. How long is these particular plants going to live? Not very long. So you get something that's relatively accessible like these plants. How long is that going to live after a couple people come and hack some samples? Not very. Further down the gallery here, unfortunately this particular tree in South Africa, it's called the underground forest. And these particular plants in South Africa have developed the ability to grow underground. And you think, oh, a tree that grows underground? Absolutely. Unfortunately, this particular plant, because road patterns had changed in South Africa, is no longer living. It was 13,000 years old. And only because we needed to change a few traffic patterns as humans for our convenience, does it now not live. Farther down, going from Africa to South America, in Chile and the Atacama Desert, I think this is one of the more Beautiful photographs that Rachel has taken. She uses a medium format camera. And anybody not familiar with that, the negatives that you get are two and a half inches by two and a half inches. They're quite large, so you get these beautiful prints on the wall that no matter how close you look, you see more and more detail. So Rachel didn't just go around with a little point and shoot click, click, click. She really invested the time and effort to take spectacular photographs. And you'll see they don't, they don't have that same look as a 35 millimeter camera, because of that larger format film, she was able to capture these things. I mean, if you're going to dedicate 10 years of your life to go around the planet, you certainly don't want to take your little cell phone and click, click, click. No, you really want to go for the effort and come back with something spectacular. And I think that's what Rachel did. Now, question? Can you speak about that a little more? It looks like it's been photoshopped. Is that the natural color against the background? It is really wild. Yeah, actually, all the photos I've seen, I looked that particular guy up online, and that's exactly that's how it, it looks. looks like, huh? Yeah, and there's uh, another sample, I think, a little bit farther down the desert. I mean, it's gray, barren, and these beautiful green globs of stuff, plant, living. And this is marked at several thousand years old. Again, desert regions, things that most people don't want to go to and arguably thank goodness. Yes. You know, Rachel had said for scientific purposes there's no reason to shop or to, uh, to change sure. the photos at all. She wanted them to be exactly the way they are. Oh, sure. And that, that's... Well, we are hanging in an art museum, so that was part of the question. Oh, yeah. And I'm, that's actually part of the fun part is her effort was to capture the essence of these animals, fungi, and plants to bring it and share it with us, because are, has anybody been to Antarctica, <coughs> Greenland, Atacama, uh, Atacama Desert, really, or uh, further down, Namibia? Probably not. I mean, in most people's lifetimes, you'll never get the chance to go to these places, and yet, in order to go to these places and bring this back, you have to dedicate a lot of time. Just, I mean, I, I really enjoy some, some of the pictures from Greenland and Antarctica, because these are the places that I've been to, and I know how much effort it took to get there. So I really appreciate the effort that Rachel went through. But you see these grand schemes, you see this tree here behind these folks, the Palmer's Oak, it's 13,000 years old, and you know where that thing lives? Southern California, the mecca of... <laughs> Just about 90 miles out of Los Angeles. That thing has been discovered to be about 13,000 years old. And this is another one of those trees that grows down, plants roots, shoots out, and then regrows. So this is another tree that actually has the ability to clonally grow and keep growing forever, should conditions allow it to do so. And as far as I know, I've never discovered this tree in all my travels living in Southern California. And it's probably a good thing that it's not that well known, because otherwise, again, it might not be there. Farther down here, 
I actually like this photograph that Rachel made of General Sherman. Has anybody been to Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks? A few? Anybody seen General Sherman? Looks like a couple of school buses stacked together and turned brown. Yeah, that tree, one of the trees, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago was believed to be the oldest living thing on Earth. It's about 2,200 years old. Compared to some of these things, it's a child. It's a baby. And that tree has been protected. There's a lot of walkways around it, but railings, because it's invincible to fire, virtually invincible to bugs, but it's one Achilles heel is that it has a shallow root system. So when people are walking around these things and driving their cars and everything, what happens? Also, back in the early 1900s, these trees were logged heavily as well. And why, I don't know, because sequoia wood is terrible for construction. It's worthless for fence. But back in the day, we said, hey, you know, let's cut this thing down because we can. Yeah, fortunately, we stopped that. We almost lost them all. These creosote bushes, down again in Southern California, 13 plus thousand years old, I've been in the desert and running around and never give a thought to these things. And yet, they have the ability to propagate underground and pop up and just keep going. So now, next time I'm out in the desert, I'll definitely appreciate and think, wow, I might be stepping on something that's 3,000 years old and I would have no clue. These particular lichens, again, they don't exactly win the beauty contest, but they win the slowest growth contest ever. These lichens grow one centimeter every 100 years. They actually move slower and grow slower than continents are moving on Earth, and yet it survives. Further down here, South Georgia Island, some more of this Antarctic moss again. Super tough place to live, barely hanging on to life. You notice you don't see any big trees or anything in these photographs. Because any of these places where Rachel has gone, it's way beyond the tree line, beyond about 75 degrees latitude north or south. Very little can actually survive there. And you'll notice in all these photographs, have you seen any large animals, humans, anything like that? No, because it takes a lot of energy to stand upright, to walk, to do all these things. We don't live nearly as long. In order to live that long, you can't be so mobile and so active. You have to be very conservative in how you spend your energy and your resources. Further down here, you can see a Norse grave photo, and you say, hey, wait a minute, how does that make sense? What does this have to do with anything? Well, that's actually a great story that happened to Rachel. She was in Greenland trying to find these lichens, map lichens, to discover, and she was out with a couple of evolutionary biologists and archaeologists, and they only had one sat for one, one way of communication. They said, hey, we need to break up our party because archaeologists need to go over here, Rachel, you need to go over there, biologists, you need to go here. And they said to Rachel, hey, okay, take your photos, do this work, and then go and find this yellow cabin out in the woods, woods being relative in Greenland. So she decided, okay, well, I'm going to brave it out, do that, and she began walking. I'm lost. I have no way of communicating. I'm not prepared to survive in the Arctic. She quickly realized that once these people left, if they forgot here, she would have no way to survive and no way to return to civilization. So she met some people, and of course they spoke Greenlandic, and she didn't speak any Greenlandic. And they said, I kind of pointed her in a direction. Okay, no idea. And they closed the door. Like, okay, there's a stranger here. She doesn't look like us. So she eventually wandered and found this cabin. And thought, well, I've got a cabin. I don't know what's going on. So she lit a few candles, put them in the window for light. Just a little bit later, eight hours, people come and came and discovered her and rescued her. And away she went. So that eight hours, compared to the thousands of years that these plants have covered, felt like a thousand years to Rachel Sussman because, wow, I'm lost in Greenland. I mean, has anybody ever, I mean, a couple of people I'm sure have flown to Europe, you fly over Greenland on the way there, does it look very hospitable? Like, oh yeah, no, not exactly. So 
in Rachel's travel, she definitely discovered, like, oh, wow, uh, a few missteps, miscommunications, and you will become part of the landscape very quickly. If everyone wants to turn around, those aspens there, tens of thousands of years old. Aspens actually have the ability to colonially grow, and also they grow underground and pop up. So if you notice a lot of the aspen colonies around Jackson Hole and Utah, they always stay in patches and they kind of grow semicircular amorphous. That's because those trees will run a root out and then pop up another tree far away. Nobody actually knows. They're actually considered the largest living multi-stock organism on the planet. Biomass. Be yes, the because of biomass. Yes. yes. Because even though the sequoias by volume are the largest plant and creature on Earth. That, by biomass, is actually the largest living thing on Earth. And it's in Utah. Mm-hmm. It's here. Well, this particular grove was genetically tested and those are all one organism. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing about that. Only with modern DNA testing have we even figured out that, wow, you do the DNA on one tree, 200 feet away you do a sample on another. This is the same thing. It's quite a shock. Further down here, when Rachel went to South Africa to look for these boabab trees, she did have to have armed escorts to take care of the lions, take care of the hyenas. So sure, you might get stuck in Greenland, you might fall in the water in Antarctica, but of all those travels and all those crazy things you do, you don't really want to become part of the food web. So Rachel really uh, had to go out of her way to be careful with that as well. And farther down here, some of the photographs of more of the Atacama Desert, and it gives you an idea just how desolate this region of northern Chile actually is. Other than these few little shrubs that live there, there is virtually nothing else that can survive in that region of the world. One of the more beautiful photographs Rachel has, more of the Greenlandic landscape, and that's actually why I went there in 2008, because I saw some photographs of this place and thought, man, that, that's alien, that's so otherworldly, I have to go there. And I can see what drew Rachel to do this work, and also to go to this place as well. When she went down to Tasmania here, what looks like mostly a dead forest from a forest fire, Rachel was almost blocked from getting these photographs because of political reasons. And you think, oh, well, what's going on in Tasmania? Not really much. It's not the Middle East. Nothing really uh, bad's going on. But she discovered it was uh, all about the humans again, saying, no, this is my force. No, this is my force. You can't go there. And she had this whole drama where she went all the way to Tasmania, south of Australia, and she almost missed the chance to get her photographs, only because people were fighting with each other. It had nothing to do with safety, nothing to do with her work. Just all again about all. Further down here in the Namibia <coughs> Desert, this thing looks like just a wrecked shrub. Nothing. It's actually an ancient conifer. The documentation says that it actually only has two leaves on it, but it looks so shredded. After a couple thousand years old, I'd probably look a little bit worse than that, too. But again, surviving in these hostile, inaccessible environments is the only way that these creatures have been able to make it for so many years. Further down, one of the smaller photographs she has of the bristlecone pine. The, there's a brochure down at the end of the case, but the bristlecone pine used to be thought of as the oldest living creature on the planet. Well, we've discovered that that's not quite the case. I've actually been to the White Mountains here. It's all above 10,000 feet. The soil is very alkaloid, so virtually nothing else can grow but these trees. So it's a great survival mechanism of well, dang, I need to survive and I've got a lot of competition. Well, let's move where no one else can survive and where no one else can live. And that's actually what that pine has actually done. Is it uh, the quarters for national parks, they have the bristlecone pine for Nevada, I think. Yes, in Wheeler, on Wheeler Peak, yeah. in the only national park in Nevada, they call it the Great Basin National Park. Yeah. There's a story, let's see if I can find the info here. Yeah, there's a 
a young biologist, he was going in the story in 1964, he was taking some core tree samples. And that's just this little pencil thin thing, it's a drill with a hollow center in there. And I was talking to the ranger, said, oh, I need to sample this thing, okay, I'm going to get the permits, blah, blah, blah. So he begins coring this thing, pink, oh man, I busted my drill bit. And he said, talk to the ranger, and as a graduate student, you don't exactly have a lot of money to go buy a new one. So he said, ranger, you know, I, I need to make this measurement, get my research done. The ranger said, oh, there's a lot of trees here. Just, just cut that one down. <laughs> the tree was named Prometheus. Up to that time, it was the oldest living thing on earth. Because we needed to take a sample. Since then, fortunately, fortunately, there have been some older trees that have been discovered. But it was a very good lesson of convenience. Like, oh darn, this thing, it's inconvenient for me. Let me just chop this down to get to my sample. Yeah, he's uh, gone on from biology and now works in geology, so it kind of ruined his career. But it's a very good lesson. In, just, just think about this for a moment. Throw it back. The spruce in this photograph is up in Sweden. It's over 9,000 years old, and that's a colonially growing, growing tree as well, where it'll actually shoot down, run out roots, and pop out all sorts of places. Again, far north, very inaccessible, harsh conditions. Not easy living. So when I asked Rachel, what's the last thing that she wants to leave with you folks, is that she wants to humanize these animals, fungus, plants, bacteria, because to tell the story of deep time, I mean, we can't conceive of something a couple thousand years old, let alone 10,000 years old, 50,000 years old. I mean, prehistory, history has only been around for 4,000, 5,000 years. Written history, anything that we know, and yet these plants blow us away by spades, by a factor of 10, almost 100. We can't even relate to it. So she wants to convey the message that these things on earth are important. She doesn't want to bludgeon over the head of, okay, be careful of the environment, but she wants to do the subtle, beautiful message. When you see this, you think, wow, maybe we need to be a little more careful about this. Maybe we need to be more thoughtful. That was Rachel's ultimate message, and that's what drew her in, is realizing that around the world, things may be changing a little bit. Maybe we should consider what we need to do about our future to ensure that things tens of thousands of years of older than us continue to live and have the right to live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions I can answer? Yeah. I have another question about the bristlecone. Um, it lost its, its status as the oldest living thing. Um, what is, does it have any status left? Yes, it is the oldest living unitary sort of item where it actually had to have, yes, where it's not just solo, but it actually had to use sexual reproduction to have pollen to go into stamens to actually grow, whereas the clonal and clipping didn't because they're cloning. So it still retains its status as that, yes, absolutely. So, And these can be accessed, go into California, drive up in the White Mountains, you can walk around, oh yeah. It's beautiful, but I mean, it's like going to the top of the tram and trying to hoof around. I mean, you'll be sucking wind. And it is cold and it is harsh there. But there is a campground, highly recommend it. <laughs> uh, other questions? No? One question about that, that, that. What is that called again? It's a spruce. The spruce. What about the green on the bottom there? What is, is that just a shrub or anything to do with it? Well, so what's been discovered in the last 50 years, because things have been warming up, that tree has just been very, very slowly growing. But in the last 50 years, one of the branches in the center has actually shot out there. Mm. Because it's starting to get a little bit warmer up in northern Sweden. And all of a sudden this plant discovers, hey, conditions are great. I better send something out to keep growing, because you know, next ice age or something that pops up, I might have to hang out for another 10,000 years to survive. How many ice ages have these things gone through in 5,000, 8,000, 10,000 years? Well, the last ice age ended 12, 15,000. Is it that long? Yeah, that, okay. where if you look at ancient paintings in Egypt and North Africa, they'll actually show the Sahara as being a grassland. 
not an arid wasteland. So way back before that, mastodons and all that, yeah, the last ice age, for some reason there have been, I think, uh, 21 or 22 total ice ages in the history of the Earth that we know of. And for some reason, the last one really wiped stuff out. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe they all took up smoking. <laughs> so that means that climate change is a sequential thing that has occurred all through time. Is that correct? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, you get an asteroid that falls on the planet. Actually, in the research material back there, Rachel talks about the... Uh, there's a huge volcanic explosion about 60,000 years ago, wiped out, I think it was 60-70% of all species. This is not the first time that's happened, in about 482 AD. The Krakatoa volcano blew up, and if you look at history right around that time, every civilization on Earth changed. Right around 1000 to 1100 AD, if you travel the southwest of America, New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, you'll see all these info plaques and they'll say right around 1000 to 1100 AD, all civilizations here, gone. Nobody knows. The Anasazi, all that. Nobody has a clue. It just so happens to coincide with the medieval Mondom from about 800 to 1100 AD where the Vikings were cruising around and doing their cool thing. Anybody watch the TV show? <laughs> right now, right now. Right. Because it was warmer back then. And so you could actually travel without having to run and worry about running into icebergs. But all of a sudden, that ended, and it got the little ice age, everything got cold, and the exact same time all around the planet, people disappeared. There's actually talks about that volcano, the theory is that humans at that time got to reduce to only about 10,000 people, maybe, give or take. They said maybe down to a thousand pairs of people. So we're all we were that close to ceasing to exist from a volcano, just one. Krakatoa went off in the late 1800s. Was yes. that a major climate change? No. Also? Yeah. It, it did affect some things. That the explosion from Krakatoa at that time, that sound rippled around the Earth six times. Ooh. That was the first item that was communicated around the planet because telegraphy, telegraphs using Morse code, had just come into play at that time. So that was like, oh my gosh, they know exactly when that happened and you're in the UK and you hear this boom, thunder. What was that? Beep, 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 beep. A volcano just blew up in Indonesia. Yes. Uh, somewhat related to this, in a recent issue of uh, National Geographic, in a museum, there's Adam and Eve, and next to Adam and Eve is a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, the uh, books Dinotopia and whatnot. No. I'm not a researcher or scientist, I'm, I'm a speaker, so uh, I can't argue with that. What in, did you learn at all about Rachel's determination, her discipline, her perseverance for a young person? Remarkable. Okay, absolutely. She had to quit her master's in fine art program. She had to quit her PhD program. Because the quote she used from Mark Twain, never let schooling get in the way of your education. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not saying leave school, please. <laughs> However, sometimes when you find this and you discover, man, I want to pursue this thing, you better look at your watch, because it might take you 10 years of determination to create this exhibit that you don't even know where the program is going. She said in her book, I was featured in the Wall Street Journal, but I couldn't even pay my rent. <laughs> That's the kind of determination you have to have to do these sorts of things, to come up with grants, to get the funding. And it's not exactly cheap to go to South Georgia Island, Greenland, and Antarctica. I mean, you can't even get a commercial flight to Antarctica. The minimum cost to step on the continent is $22,000. And you can't get on Travelocity.com and do it either. <laughs> so for a young lady to say, you know, I'm a young man, a young person, man, I'm going to do this. And she started out in Southern California in the Mojave Desert. Okay, let's get a little of the piecemeal easy ones. Then it grows. Hey, let's go a little bit farther. Let's go to Sweden. That's accessible. And it grows and grows. And in her mind, 
It became this exploration of the world. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.